Um, yes, okay. <laughs> so, um, three, two, one, go. In open government, we think that generally speaking, communities should have the right to set their own rules. We think that generally, countries are good in representing the people all over the countries, but specifically when we talk about minority communities that have very different values from the rest of the country, it is very important that they will have the ability to set the rules that fit them the most. But we think that this case goes even farther, because other than just values, we think that religion by itself has much power in how we perceive the right of people to act by their religion. Therefore, we think that the power of this religion and the right to go by religion is even more important than the regular right to just set the rules to your communities. I'm going to talk about three main things in my speech. Why principally, we think it is incredibly important to let people to set their own rules, especially in religious communities. Secondly, why do we think that without doing this, there is underground punishment that happen after this motion. Why do we think this over what happens on this side of the house? And thirdly, I talk about how religion is actually going to change to be more positive. Get a few points of mechanism. We think that mostly the things that are most relevant to most religious people are things that are mostly within the communities. Things like how you are buried, things like how you are married, things like how you do like within your interpersonal behaviors. But obviously, if people will want to opt out of the regular rules and go to their specific rules in other aspects as well, we are going to allow that. Obviously, we won't let extreme punishments that are not allowed under the constitution to happen on this side of the like under the their side of the house, but we think that generally speaking, they will have a great level to do the thing that fits them the most. If there are any clarification, I'd love to hear them now. Great. So let's move on. Firstly, on the principal right. We think there are two very different and very important reasons why people should have the principal right to do this. We think this point by itself, each of every one of those reasons wins the debate. So please listen because it's important. First of all, the right to your religion. We think that generally speaking, people have a right to go by the religion. This right is extremely important to all people who pursue it. Why is that? Because generally speaking, the right of the government to take your rights is dependent on the fact that those rights are not too important to you. This is why we don't allow the government to make you a slave. This is why we don't allow the government to just arbitrarily kill people, because we think that there is a limit to how much the government can't take your rights from you. And specifically when talking about religion, we think that for many people, religion is the most important thing for them. Even if most of the people within this room are not religious at all and don't think it matters very much, for people who are religion, this thing is a thing that they are willing to sacrifice their life for in many means. Those are things that they limit their every single action for it. We think that this is incredibly important for them. They should have a lot of rights within this context. Why do we think that those specific things are inherited to give people religious rights? Because we tend to think of rights as a very individualistic thing, but it is not what happens in a religious person's mind. Because religion is community-wise inherently. We think that in order for you to live a religious life and a coherent religious life, your community has to act in the same way. You have to walk around and the people around you to live the same way you want to live. We know that for people in Israel, we think that the Messiah is not going to come if people around them are not going to act the same way. We think that for many other people, if someone within their community is a sinner, they think that they will also personally are going to go to hell. We think that those things are incredibly important to people. And we think that the fact that today, the ability to enforce norms on the community is not within the community itself, harms the ability of the people to live by the rules of their own religion. It makes them think that they are going to go to hell. It makes them think that they are adhering to the rules of their religion. We think itself, and therefore the government shouldn't have the right to do that, and it must allow the people to go by their own religion. Secondly, I will talk about not the right to your religion, but the right to your rules in your community. We think that generally, when we talk about why do we make rules, it is for creating norms within the community. The reason why not the victim is the one who's suing, but the government is the one suing in criminal court at all, is because we want to shape how people act within 
but we think that also here the government's power is limited. It is limited because we don't want to shape like to what people do not agree to. We think that rules generally differ immensely between different countries, between different society, what is considered a crime, how a crime should be punished. There is no like objective truth. Therefore, the only way to set what is right for the country is to know what the people agree to. We think that generally it works because generally most people within the country has the same amount of like values and stuff. But specifically when we talk about minority religious communities that have very different, we think it gives the ability for them to actually live a more autonomous life in rules that reflect them more if they go by this religion. Opposition might say, but people don't choose those rules. Like those are just the religious leaders. But we think that people adhere by these leaders. Otherwise, that we have lived those communities like specifically. They already give a lot of their like day-to-day -day life to what their leader is going to say to them. We think that generally it represents them much, much better than the 90% of non-religious people who live in the same country. It creates better rules for Doro community. Before I move on, I take closing if they have something. Your principle is based on third party harm. For would you allow non religious individuals to punish their son, for instance, for being gay just based on their homophobic preferences, which are non religious, to follow your principle? We think that if people, if the religious courts deem the religions, if people think that they are going to go to hell because of this, yes, we are going to let people do those things. We think it is important enough to those people. Great. Let's move on. Let's go on to the underground punishments, because this is also extremely important. Religion is still important to a lot of people. People don't want still to live in immoral societies. Therefore, these rules not existing creates two different things that happens within the society. First of all, in many cases, people take the power to themselves. This is specifically the most extreme people, specifically like young people and male people who always think that they have the power to decide on stuff. This is why we see people killing on the fact of like family honor in many places. This is why we see people like beating up women who don't put enough clothes in the really places in Israel. We think that those things and also the gay son is going to happen in both sides, but it's going to happen by the most extreme people. And this is not going to happen when the religious authority is going to decide that this is the right thing to do by the religion. The other thing that is going to happen is just religious leaders not deciding with the full facts because they can't have enough facts to have the best rulings decided. Therefore, we create worse processes that still have going by the rules of court. We think that our side is much better from all of those reasons. Please support the motion. Thank you. Thank you. Second speaker for Gov, please. Can you hear me? Cool. Uh, also, if you have uh, POIs, I prefer that you raise your hand. So I'm looking at the videos. Okay. So starting, right, waiting for the other judge, sorry. Okay. I find the case coming from OO a bit strange because notice that on the, look, you can practice religion on your own and you can have your wonderful traditions and then their entire case is against religion and saying, oh, but it's so in, enforcing on you and it's so wrong and it chooses laws and so on. So it's a bit weird. You have to decide in opposition whether you like religion and religious freedom and then you allow it and then you can't say to people, oh, but I like this part of your religion and I don't like this part of your religion and so on. Or you actually go against that and then you can't say, oh, but you can freely practice whatever you want on your own. But then secondly, their point about you can have religion on your own misses our entire case because notice that in order to have a religion, you must have a community. There are certain things that you cannot do on your own in order to be religious. And in order to do that, you need to have establishment that support that as well. And some of it is policing people to behave in a way that God wants you because if some people are deviant to the rules of God, you personally 
only go to hell because you as a community have a responsibility over them and you oftentimes cause them to sin or you yourself can sin more if you're exposed to things that God tell you that you shouldn't have. So let's say someone mocks the religion in your community, you are then sinful because you are the one that has to see that. Someone doesn't slaughter food in the proper way, you have nothing to eat in that community. Notice that this harms the, re the, the religious freedom of everyone. And right now, notice that they don't really have a choice because right now we don't think that regular secular courts actually take that into consider. On the, on, to, on the contrary, they go against that because it goes against what other secular people in society believe. But also notice that their case is like saying, okay, we are for the freedom of speech and you can practice it on your own. And if someone prevents you from talking, we would do nothing about it, right? Who's preventing you from talking? So this exactly shows why they have a problem. But then they tell you, look, but there is this evil enforcement, enforcing that we're doing on people. So first of all, notice already the tension that we have. But secondly, notice that every rule is enforcing you, right? I don't choose to be born in Israel. I don't choose to be born in Switzerland. But yet, I have to abide certain rules, right? There is a degree of coercion that applies from the fact that you live in a society. So obviously, it should be done there. We don't think that religion or a religious community is necessarily way worse than society at large. We don't think that the American secular society is that great at handling drugs. We don't think the prison is necessarily more humane than getting a punishment under a religious rule. We think that sometimes a religious court can even understand better what is better for your needs, what you feel like, what protects your family more, even if you are a felon, and so, uh, and so on. Not yet. Uh, so we think here that they don't have a reason to oppose this. But then also notice that their characterization of mm, the religious leaders are going to become so overempowered and they're going to abuse the system so wrong because notice that a lot of historical case about religion is Vatican II happened before there was a state telling you what to do. Polygam the banning of polygamy in Judaism happened in the medieval times under Judaism rules and not under a state. We think that they are constantly, that, not yet, the, uh, the interest to change within the community. And we think that this is something that is going to happen further still, even if they have their own religious courts. And the reason for that is because no community lives in isolation and moreover leaders knows that they have competition right they know that cell phones exist and people have access to the wild world they know that there are other communities so let's say the even uh, the evangelists are in uh, in a competition with the catholics in and that's why the catholics are now trying to reform because they don't want people leaving them and we think that there are many liberal and good religious people and it's <laughs> it's quite a generalization should say yeah, all of them are evil, all of them want to do bad things, considering that you yourself acknowledge that even the Pope is now becoming better. So we think that those people would now flourish. But then also notice the comparative, because if we're talking about the extreme, right now, as Ido already tells you, they get their way, even without the state recognition of a court. We say that there is black enforcement of religious rules that is happening due to the lack of a religious court that is recognized by anyone. We think that the lack of a court actually empowers vigilante justice by members that are not the leaders, that are not people that are accountable to they can actually want people to somehow live in a harmonious community, but more of people that are emboldened and want to show that they are willing to be violent for the religion not to be violent. And those people don't even get reprimanded by their community, even though people don't agree because no one wants to be seen as a snitch. No one wants to be the one that is a traitor that now goes and tells uh, the Gentiles that there is a problem with that person. And we think that this is a situation that is much more violent in a situation that communities can't really combat. What we are doing is we are offering a way to actually try and change slowly. And before I explain how this happens, Jason. Okay. Under your principle, would you allow people to form courts under other preferences or under belief systems which are not religious, i.e., for instance, homophobia? No. 
and the right is a reason of practicality. Notice that we believe that groups have rights. That's the reason why Switzerland and the UK have different rules, because we think that they should have the ability to design their life. And yet, we don't think everyone should do it, because then it gives a preference to the people that are stronger, just like the vigilante justice that I've described to you. But we allow people to try and influence the system and the rules that they live in. We think that this happens wonderfully in a democracy, but it doesn't happen enough for religious groups because they are a, minor a minority, and a minority has no way of influencing. But even if we think that they do, we think that this might be bad. We think if you have a problem with the religious minority being homophobic, the fact that you allow them to create precedents in the regular court, the, if you allow them to fight for regular rules for the secular population, actually, you are creating more of a coercion on others. So in our world, there is more of a choice. You can choose to be religious and then you don't go to hell. And you can choose to opt out and then you have the secular rules that we like so much. And in your world, you get no choice, vigilante justice and more violence. I'm very proud to propose. Thank you. Next speaker for up, please. I'd like to call for the third speaker for the Hi, uh, I would prefer POIs by hands, if that's okay, because I can see people on screen, but I have to read quite closely in order to read off the chat, if that's okay. Cool? Okay, three, two, one. Let's be very clear in this debate. The question is not whether religions have the right to punish. Religions are nothing but a set of prescriptive behaviours. What you believe, what you can eat, what you can do and who you can love. And you are punished. You are taught to punish yourself by feeling guilt, by blaming yourself for what you perceive are sins. You are punished by the community that sees you eating certain things or sees you dressing certain ways and says that you are damned and says that you are sinful. The question of this debate is, in a world where you are going to be punished, whether it is preferable that you know the standard of that punishment. And we say, it is preferable that those laws and that those standards are set by a body of courts rather than the cleric within your community. And that is what we will bring to you at Closing Government. Three things I will do. Firstly, and briefly, dealing with the opening half clash on this right to punish and the principle and the best harm from OO, which is about the ascription of, the ascription of behaviours. Secondly, why this makes religion prescriptions of behaviour better, because this system moderates the standards of of behaviours that are prescribed, and thirdly, why this is better for the people who opt in and at least gives individuals the right to absolution. The first thing I want to do, and quickly, is to deal with the opening half clash, um, which, which I've merged into one issue, which is essentially that OGOO says that there's no right to punish prince, so it's a principal violation for religions to have this right. OG says, well, actually, they are punishing you because you're going to be sinned and communities actually already do this. But they don't really set up the counterfactual, so let me do that for you. There are incentives within communities to punish individuals that you perceive as violating the religious standards around you. That is because that people still have disagreements about the standards of interpretation, that they're people that OO points to the clerics and communities do have an incentive to centralize control. I'll take you at the end of this, Jason. 
that there are entrenched hierarchies of power within those religions, that, that you feel an individual responsibility to enforce those standards to the extent that there is no community standard or no authorised standard that can enforce it. So it has to be you to do it, that the only way to enforce it are normative. And the ways that that happens is in ways that are less transparent. It's things like people talking amongst themselves, standards of behaviour, damning people in, impressionistically, and that these are things that occur without any ability for you to consent because you cannot control the conversations around you. You cannot control the ways that guilt is inflicted upon you, isolation is inflicted upon you, exclusion and shame is inflicted upon you. And to that extent, that comparative means that there is no right to punishment, but there is punishment and the question is a comparative one. And when you look at this comparative, this harm of ascription is one that falls on government side because in their world, maybe you look at someone eating pork and think, well, they haven't opted into the religious courts, they're not a Jewish person. But in, our, in, the, in the world that they defend, you see someone eating pork and they are not a Jewish person. In our world, you have the right or the actual ability to consent to that narrative by opting in or opting out, CO. On either side of the house, there will always be judgment and guilt for individuals. The critical difference in this debate oh, sorry, is I, that this I, gives... Exactly. Go again. Can you start again? Sorry, I think we... Okay, no worries. Again. On either side of the house, individuals will be guilted and shamed. The difference is that your side allows the coercion of the state to enforce things like jail time or fines, which is a disproportionate harm. Okay, so this I think turns on the second question, which is what these courts actually look like, which is a, which is a stunningly underanalyzed part of this debate so far. So we say these courts look like things which are unlikely to imprison people very often or to fine people very often, and are far more likely to find innocent or give people a slap on the wrist or say things like, this is an ideal within the religion rather than a standard of behavior. So secondly, why this makes those standards of prescription much less formal and much less shameful than in their world. But I would also note that in some instances, it would probably be preferable to cop a fine than to cops total social isolation from your community, which is what happens in yours. So the mission question of this debate is how these courts actually operate. Funnily enough, OO gives us the first incentive as to why these courts are likely to be rather moderate in their interpretation of these texts, as opposed to rather strict and literal, which is to say that at the moment that there have this scale of uh, like laws like modesty and humility and they set a set of examples but at the moment they don't enforce them because they know lots of people will leave but the moment that that is strictly tied to a formal institution which inescapably puts its stamp of religion on it now they will have to which is exactly untrue because in this status quo, when communities are enforcing those standards of behaviour, those communities are not tied to the religion. It is not the religion's fault. People do not have a reason to, uh, like to disappear from Catholicism just from those communities. But in their world, or sorry, in our world, when the courts uh, are the voice of Catholicism, when the courts are the voice of God, it is in that world where people are more likely to tie that association and to major and that instance have more of an incentive to leave and that is the first reason why courts have an incentive not to err on the side of strictly textual literalism for more though firstly because of the incentive to be the same so because these different communities which our og model rather than a body of law have different standards of law they have an incentive to try and make the laws as similar as possible for the reason that they want to represent a unified religion and for it to fracture would be to fracture the religion as a whole and to that extent they have to moderate between the most progressive communities and the most and the least progressive communities which means it is more likely just structurally to be a more moderate type of decision secondly the structure of the court is one which tends towards a moderating influence rather than a harsh one. Firstly, that you get two parties advocating and comparative to Quo, the parties that are advocating against the religion are also respected religious individuals within that community, which means they are more likely to be able to moderate the decision of the court. Secondly, that there are published reasons as opposed to private ones or non-transparent ones, which means that you are accountable you're out of time for the decisions that individuals make. Thirdly, because of the process of interpretation, which is textual and is recorded and is when transparent. Fourth reason, the incentives of the community 
you have the incentive to avoid backlash and to the extent these are public decisions and ones which will be made publicized and ones which are associated with the church you are unlikely to want to be as unpopular as possible what this means is first laws are clarified you are more likely to understand the standards and it is far more likely that the things which are unlawful are at the higher end you know like adultery murdering your neighbor as opposed to things like you know trying coveting your neighbor's wife or lying or respecting your parents which are more likely to be ideals rather than enforceable standards in law. Secondly, that to the extent they are moderate, you're able to separate yourself as a religion from extremism, which allows for disassociation there. Thirdly, that it is far easier to call out individuals, for example, evangelists who have had multiple wives, like saying that they have violated the standard where those are the laws and these are not them. And the final thing I'll say is, yeah. So at the end of this, we get the best outcomes because whilst there is no right to punish, there is punishment and it is only on our side that individuals are less likely to be punished. Thank you for that speech. I'd like to call upon the third speaker for the opposition. Can people hear me? I was having mic problems earlier. Great. I'm going to be doing three things in this speech. Firstly, principled rebuttal that will allow us to independently win because I think that OO is incredibly flippant in responding to OG's claims. Secondly, why applications of these laws are likely to be inconsistent and why that is harmful. And then thirdly, an actual characterization about why these courts are likely to be structurally conservative and how this is going to slow the pace of religious reform. On to rebuttal. I want to start by responding to the OG claim about how there are like community benefits that come from a consistent application of laws. Two things here. Firstly, they never approved why this is an exclusive way to access the community benefits of religion. Most people think that they're going to go to heaven or hell based on their own behavior rather than the behavior of other people. But furthermore, people within your religion will still have like generally similar beliefs if a few people break the law, so they don't get that as an exclusive benefit. But secondly, it is a moral wrong to instrumentalize people even if you buy that there are going to be community benefits. That is, if everyone else within your religion is happier, you do not have the right to deny my individual claim to justice. This instrumentalization is particularly important for two reasons. The first one is that you do not consent to be a part of that religious community in the first place. But secondly, you are not instrumentalizing someone for an epistemically morally correct reason, but rather for just the whims of what a particular religious group tends to believe. They're often very harmful beliefs, i.e. gay people deserve to burn in hell. The second principled claim that I want to respond to is that because religion is important, you should effectively have a right to decide the rules. What I would actually claim under this is that we are better for choice when it comes to, to deciding law. As religious courts tend to be undemocratic in nature, as religion is not based on like popular will, but it is based on what religious elites have decided the word of God is. So you have no power in shaping the laws that you have. Contrast that though to democratic systems, where if a lot of people are religious, there is at least some possibility of change and getting laws that you want through aggregating people's preferences within that context. So we flip OG's principle here. All ref to CG will be integrated. First claim, why are application of these laws likely to be inconsistent? To make our case frame very clear, basically we think that how in individual laws are applied is likely to be inconsistent when it comes to things like sentencing, but broadly speaking, there are going to be trends where these courts are going to be overwhelmingly conservative in nature. When it comes, though, to individual application, when it comes to, like, your sentencing or your finding of innocence or guilt, why are there likely to be a lot of uncertainty? Two things here. Firstly, Actual interpretations are incredibly religiously am ambiguous. That is to say, when you have scriptures, there are often interpretations that exist. What this means is that like different imams or different like high up like Catholic people with, with these courts might literally have a different understanding of what is religiously correct or what is not religiously correct. And there are often multiple translations about whether something is correct or not. So it's unclear that you can actually predict that punishment. Secondly though, features of courts that emphasize consistency under the status quo is an incredibly Western centric phenomenon. So things like applied statutory sentencing guidelines where you know what your punishment will be, or even just things like precedent, we know these things to be true because they apply in Western courts, but there's very few other systems due to like historical discrepancies of how those religious systems have developed that actually have these same features of consistencies that Western courts ultimately do. What this means is that when it comes to an individual offense, it is unclear on an individual level, like 
on a surface level, whether you'll be found innocent or guilty, but more importantly, what the scope of your punishment under the court is likely to be. Why is this very important? Firstly, a basic principle of law is that people should not be punished for things that they are unable to anticipate. This is because we think that people's free will matters. And given the overwhelmingly coercive power of the state that OG also identifies, you should only be punished for something that me, myself, am actively able to predict what the punishment of that thing is going to be. So they create a moral wrong for every person who they incarcerate or who they punish, who is unable to consent to those harms. But secondly, these courts just become legally unfunctional, where things like deterrence becomes a lot more difficult when you're uncertain about punishment. Like, second claim that one. Let's not give an actual characterization about what these courts are likely to look like and then why that's going to be really harmful. O's claim here is incredibly assertive. They say that these courts are hierarchies. Their analysis basically stops there. We're going to forward this claim by saying that structurally, these courts are more likely to be staffed with old conservative people who are likely to have very conservative inter interpretations of religion for a few structural reasons. The first thing to say is that old people are seen as having the most religious knowledge because you've just been involved in that religious system for a larger quantity of years time Wise. So what this means is that you're likely to get incredibly old people who have who have internalized interpretation of religion that is more a thing of the past rather than a modern progressive belief. The, th the second thing to say here is that decision makers in terms of like who appoints people within these courts are likely to be a religious elite because only a very high up person within that religion is going to be perceived as being bestowed with the kind of religious knowledge where they can actually adequately choose a kind of people who are going to make very religiously important decisions. Crucially, religious elites tend to have a lot of connections with older conservative people because they have like other older conservative people who are able to ride the system alongside them and they can have more ideological similarities. And as a consequence, you appoint these people. This is exacerbated by the fact that these systems are hierarchical rather than democratic. I think that thirdly, comparatively speaking, courts are more difficult to hold to account than like local congregations because people are seen as having like epistemic religious authority as opposed to your pastor, who you may feel closer to, who are less like high up on the pedestal of your connection with God and where you may have some kind of like personal connection with. The, the competing counterclaim that I get from CG here is that, oh, these courts are overly punitive, people are going to opt out. But this falls for a couple of reasons. Firstly, when you literally believe that like overly punitive laws are the like rule of God and like what God is telling you, it's unclear they're just going to magically opt out. But secondly, there can be a disconnect between the incentives of overly conservative judges and the incentive of these religions at large to become more liberal when you have these judges in positions of power. Or how you how you can get your benefits. The final thing that I want to prebut here is why you cannot just get like a bunch of smaller courts that actually cater to the whims of like liberal people. I think that thirdly, there are problems with like resource allocation. Setting up courts is very expensive, so it's unclear that minor courts could have the ability to do so. But secondly, even with like dominant strains of religion like Presbyterianism, there are often competing claims about what is actually okay under these systems. Why then is it important that we prove that these courts are structurally conservative? Firstly, it actually mechanizes opening opposition's claim that there are harms to, to certain people that exist. I think that in front half, coercion is largely a wash because it's unclear whether the people that OG says are coerced under secular laws are more important than the people that opening opposition says um, are going to be coerced to opt into these courts. Therefore, we ought to defer to the metric of how people are actually going to be treated. But secondly, they're likely to so under their side of the house. It's not true that liberal people can just opt out of these courts. Number one, a lot of these courts are like opt-in for life, like the Bindan courts. Secondly, there's massive stigma against doing so if it's going to go on record that you've chosen to opt out, which will detract from all of your credibility as a religious re as a religious reformer. But secondly, you'll fear getting kicked out of your community. But thirdly, the average person is going to become more conservative. What this means now is that you're more scared to voice liberal belief systems because you'll be deemed a heretic under these courts. You can literally be punished as opposed to the status quo you might have minor amounts of stigma, but you're not going to be thrown in jail for your life. So you get the voice of more progressive beliefs, but it's really important because so many people are coerced into religion. We got to maximize the quality of life of the average person within that religion, i.e. gay people who are currently oppressed. We continue status quo trends of progressivism rather than enshrining conservative problematic beliefs. I'm very proud to stand in closing opposition. Thank you for that speech. I'd like to call upon the last speaker for the government. Hi, can you hear me? Uh, can I get a thumbs up from Jason if you can hear me? Because I can see you. Epic. Um, I'll make it so I can see everyone. It's actually more clever. Um,
give you a number of reasons to expect that these courts will be moderate. But let's assume that she was wrong, that there'll be some courts that are moderate, some courts that are very lenient in some religions, and some courts that are very, very strict. In the ones that are insane and that are very, very strict, that means that people will leave. As per the analysis of opposition team, they will no longer opt into that official system. That's the benefit of an opt-out system. If the court is extremely lenient, as Maddie and my extension says, that means that communities no longer feel like they are pressured to control their own population because they know that that is being controlled and punished by a higher power that they can see and they know that they can abdicate to that body. So there are community responsibilities, but there's very few church members who are willing to override their priests. What we've said is something that's kind of in the middle. It's likely to be a moderate version of this law to which most people would be happy to opt in and to which most people would happily abdicate their own power to like be mean to people and to, uh, to uh, ostracize people too. And for that reason, clarity is one of the key benefits of this. And it means that the court will act in a way that is just. I'm going to do three things in this speech. The first is to deal with CO's extension. The first part of their extension states that punishment should be certain for people and that you should not punish anyone if they're not sure what that punishment would be. I wish that I had thought of this when I was pulled over for speeding, but I didn't realise that it was a 40 zone. But either way, let's look at it. Firstly, we think that even if you don't know the exact risks of punishment, in to the risk that you'll be punished to some extent. You still label yourself in a way that means that you vaguely know that if you do things that you vaguely remember from Sunday school or against the rules, you'll have some vague scale of punishment, even if you do not know exactly how that will play out. And um, secondly, as I alluded to, this is essentially the standard secular law, which kind of developed from, you guessed it, religious law, which is why it is likely to apply here as well. Thirdly, it, people are largely educated in the laws of their religion because communities put great to teaching them those rules because that is the only way that they know how to abide by them. Thirdly, fourthly rather, it is even less certain when it is just your local cleric and his whims that are enforcing it upon you, which is the counterfactual, no response. Finally, it is even less certain when you have an incentive to legislate it in, for example, all of India's laws. So now people who don't even study Hinduism have to abide by it. They didn't study it in the equivalent of Sunday school. So therefore they have to abide by a law that they've never even heard of. If certainty was an outcome that they were looking for and fairness in that sense, then we fall clearly on the side of me and Madeline's extension. Secondly, what will the courts look like? And this is our extension most clearly. We give you a number of reasons at, at a member to expect that these courts would be moderate, would offer clarity, and would allow for official debates within respected, like in a respected forum about that religion, which allows progress to happen in a way that it cannot currently happen for the very reason that there is no forum for that progress. There is no one who is dedicating their time to making the arguments in the favour of that progress. And no individual has the incentive to pay a lawyer to make an argument in favor of progress we give you that forum we get no response what do we get they say that these will be stacked with conservatives who are just heaps like who are heaps hard for the court and love the idea of like uh, love the idea of enforcing the law to the maximum this is unlikely likely to be fully true for a number of reasons the first reason is they're still likely to care about the power of the church worldwide they wouldn't want to make a court that suggests that most churches around america are actually invalid and are not actually preaching the faith that would make everyone who would otherwise give them legitimacy go offside to them Secondly, they have taught themselves how to interpret these texts for their whole lives. That's why they got into this position where they now get to uh, interpret texts. Why else would you become a rabbi or an imam, essentially a lawyer of that faith? So now they know, and, and they know, and as Maddie tells you, that no religion uh, essentially enforces exactly the letter of the law. That's why, for example, no, no Christians, you don't see them getting in trouble for wearing mixed cloths, etc., etc. So they are likely to have that ability to interpret. Thirdly, half of the world are women and half of the world's religious people are women but not all women are allowed to become clerics
networks and stuff like that. So most people, so, but there are, that means there's a huge body of the population that has an incentive to join progressive strands of that religion and become lawyers for progressive strands of that religion and make arguments in favor of it. And lastly, even if it were true that this was stacked with conservatives, it would just mean that people are unlikely to take you to court because they do not see the enforcement of that law as something that is necessarily fair. The same way that you wouldn't dob your friend in for smoking weed, but you might dob them in for smoking ice. And for that reason, if it is a really harsh version of the law, it just defers to make like for on, you know, on minor offenses that no one dobs anybody because otherwise there'd be infinite cases because every day I'm sinning. And that for the really harsh cases, we still get the benefits that Maddie and I give you, which is that you can actually be absolved, that can be dealt with and it can be over. I'll take closing opposition. Oh, sorry, opening. The case is that there's... Sorry, opening. Thanks, thanks, thanks. I guess our point was that um, these organizations intrinsically are already incredibly hierarchical, that offenses against religion are usually in content, as we explained, horrendously restrictive and arbitrary. And also, as we did say, and CEO tried to say we didn't, but we did say, you have this enormous architecture of the state, you have the capacity of Why is that all not more significant if you're punished and jailed, for instance. By this so to my understanding, there were three parts to that POI. The first part of that POI was essentially saying, do you, like, will the court that is enforcing do over and bit above, above what the state would normally do, which was essentially modelled out. Secondly, the, the next part of that was saying, oh my God, I've already forgotten it was so long. Um, that I think there was a second part of that POI that was like, would people, like, would people no longer be able to have a foot in each camp such that people want to be half in the religion, half out, and it's unfair for them to do that. There's a few reasons why that is not true firstly if you're only secretly sinning because you're mentally half out no one's ever going to find out that on both sides secondly if it's only minor stuff they're unlikely to be very harsh on that kind of punishment on both sides now lastly we think it's less coercive because people have the ability to leave at which is the argument that we give you. But then in regards to people being able to punish each other we tell you that people are no longer going to go over a court and that, that that is why that is why that is unlikely to happen so at the end of this at the, lastly it's like isn't enforcing religious law just fundamentally unfair which it is not if we enforced every person to give 10 percent to charity to the poor it would be a much better world that doesn't matter that it matters so much more than forcing people to for example wear a hat which is the draconian laws that people care about so yes we would get more hats and more charity we're proud to be in a, a closing government Thank you. That speech I'd like to call upon the final speaker for the opposition. I prefer verbal POIs, by the way. Before I move into the substantive portion of my speech, I just want to characterize what these punishments look like, because the closing government, I think, was quite disingenuous and very flippant. The question that I want to ask them is this. How do you think a religious court would prosecute or punish a gay person in the ultra politicized environment of the United States of America or within more conservative states within the Middle East, which have strong positions against being gay? We posit that these sorts of more conservative religious courts, which we can evidently see do exist based on Sharia law, will impose outcomes which are absolutely horrendous. So even though the argument may seem logically compelling, it certainly is not true with how courts are currently set up around the world. And that's for all the reasons that we talk about in terms of the incentives of individuals. So don't let them get away with the lies. I'm usually the one who gets accused of this because they debate with Chin, but genuinely this case, it is dumb. So two different things I want to chat about in this speech. First, I want to talk about which side makes these punishments better overall. And second of all, I want to talk about whether or not this is a principally justified policy. First, on whether or not this will lead to better outcomes. And I just want to clean up the arguments that come out, no thank you, from the proposition in this case. Opening government's first argument on this practical issue is that this will lead to worse decisions through honor killing and informal religious courts. I have two different responses to this argument. First of all, I want to point that there are no coercive mechanisms which can actually enforce these sorts of things. So for instance, in many circumstances, you don't have police officers who are willing to engage in that honor killing itself. 
on the comparative, we have religious uh, court accountability for people who engage in things like honor killing. So that's a massive yeah, deterrent I... for that behavior. So I just think it is very, very implausible. No, thank you. And the vast majority of cases that you get this sort of honor killing or informal religious action. The second thing that I want to point out is that their analysis makes it unclear why they wouldn't be similarly extreme on either side of the house. The opening government analysis never tells you why being in a court means that you're going to restrain that kind of action. And the only analysis that comes out from this is about moderation coming from the closing government team. But here's why the moderation yeah. argument that they identify is not sufficient in this debate. Two reasons. First of all, the first reason as to why this is the case is because in many circumstances, we can already see that despite the fact that you already feel as if God punishes individuals, you advocate for harsh punishments. And their mechanism in this debate was that this creates a form of acknowledgement of the fact that you're going to have some punishment of individuals by God, therefore you don't want to become more extreme. Given that this is symmetric on either side of the house, I think you should buy current characterization and analysis from Naomi. The second thing that I want to point out in terms of moderation is that there is a principal agent problem. So insofar as they want to bring more people into the religion, that is not the incentive of individual religious officials or individual religious clerks. Our argumentation was based on the fact oh, that they have deep-seated beliefs that are politically palatable. And both of these things are incredibly relevant because these are beliefs that they're unwilling to compromise in many circumstances. And even in the instances that they're willing to compromise these beliefs, it's sometimes advantageous within religious elites to advance within that system in order to cater to their preferences rather than the preferences of the average individual. So the analysis coming out from their side of the house simply is not sufficient on this issue. The second argument that we get is that you're going to fight for regular rules within secular communities. And this comes out from the opening government. But I just want to point out that this lobbying typically happens because you don't want others to engage in immoral behavior. So for instance, lobbying against abortion or lobbying against gay marriage is premised on the fact that you don't want secular people to engage in those actions because you think it is a moral wrong independent of whether they're religious. So you still get that sort of advocacy and that creep in. Given the fact that they do not moderate these religions, that there is a massive principal yeah, agent problem, and that the incentives of individuals are going to lean conservative, I think you get worse outcomes where you can enforce terrible decisions with the coercive mechanisms of the state. And their reasons as to why this is going to be trivial are insubstantial given the incentives of individuals. Now, they also say, well, you know, if it's really that problematic, you just won't be brought in for most religious offenses. True, you won't be brought in for many, but our argument is that for the religious offenses you are brought in for, for instance, being gay, you will have awful punishments which are disproportionate and unfair. That is a massive loss for their side of the house and hurts individuals. I think this explanation coming from our side is a much more complete explanation as to whose incentives these are and how that manifests beating the opening opposition in this debate. Second of all, let's talk about the yeah, principle I in this debate. I think, no thank you, Naomi very adequately rebuts their argument about third party harms, particularly based on the fact that this is uncharitable, given that this doesn't really hurt others within the religious community, like someone else can butcher their own halal meat in Monica. But the second thing that we pointed out is that this doesn't meet the bar for imposing criminal law, given the fact that these are not true and justified beliefs. So we think, for instance, being discriminatory based on homosexuality through the basis of religion is the same as being uh, discriminatory against homosexuality on the basis of homophobia because both are untrue and unjustified beliefs and therefore no, I... do not constitute knowledge under epistemology. What is the principle that comes from our side of the house? The principle that we first of all provide is about uncertainty. Regardless of whether or not you can opt out of a court, we think you should never be able to opt into a court that can punish you without you being able to understand the sorts of punishments that happened. And our analysis was very deep. We told you that these are the kinds of courts which already have fatwas, which give religious authorities the ability to overturn precedent and no presidential system within regular means. This is because most yeah, religious well. leaders have a direct connection to God or say they have a direct connection to God. So any alterations they describe can be said as something which is just the changing whim of God or coming from the fact that they have greater expertise. I'll take a point from opening. Other than symmetric claims on white old males in courts, CEO never claim uh, why lack of representation happens more to the 5% Muslims in secular courts, why they don't get it when they choose their imam, have competition, they have courts that match your values. Okay, but the point is that you can't have a million different courts. We already provided the preemption here. So if you don't respond to the preemption, sadly enough, that doesn't work because our mechanism says that is impossible. It's administratively very difficult. And because this is a this house believes that motion, I think it's implausible that the court would, uh, that the state would allow the creation of a hundred different religious courts. And even within different religions, there are different texts, different versions of the Bible and different interpretations. 
So our democratic, our, our principle on the issue of uncertainty, I think still stands. But I want to expand the impact and explain why it's so important. When there's uncertainty, there's an additional chilling effect. Because if you don't know what will be punished or how long you'll be punished for those sorts of offenses, you will not engage with a set of actions that the religion might actually deem as acceptable and creates massive infringements on your autonomy. The only mitigation that we get from the closing government on this is their extension, which they've taken down, and therefore that material doesn't stand. In terms of a secondary idea, I think that another distinguishing factor is that on our side of the House, all courts which are democratic allow individuals to be able to influence it through the vote. But in contrast, religious courts oblige you to follow it without you having any democratic control over those laws. So on a separate principle basis, I think it's also unjust because it means you can't control the kinds of coercion that you're subjected to. And if it is independently wrong, we think it is wrong to sell yourself into slavery, irrespective of the outcomes. We think it is similar and therefore we're very proud to oppose. Thank you very much for that speech. I think you can all wait here and we're moving to a different